Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this RCNI CPD accredited webinar on virtual awards. Um, it's great to see so many of you joining us today. I can see the counters go creeping up um, as I'm speaking. Um, and um, can you all hear me? Yes, great. OK, um, as I said, uh, it's great to see so many of you joining us today. Um, I know how difficult it can be to find time for CPD. So thank you very much uh, to the audience, to our speakers and to our sponsors today who are Baywater Healthcare, PHL Group and Dockler. Um, my name's Lisa Berry and I'll be your chair um, for the day. Um, I'm editor of Nursing Older People and co-editor of Mental Health Practice, which are two of the specialist journals published by RCNI, uh, the publishing company of the Royal College of Nursing. So today's event is the first of a two part series exploring virtual walls, which promises to be hugely valuable learning opportunity. For today's event, um, we will be defining virtual walls and the ways, the range of ways they can be implemented, showcasing um, case studies of virtual walls in practice and examining opportunities and barriers when implementing virtual walls across multidisciplinary teams. And nursing implications of virtual walls will be a focus. The second webinar in the series will be held in February next year, and that will explore lessons learned from virtual world implementation. The series of webinars will be recorded and will be available on demand, and all attendees from today uh, will be emailed uh, when the link is ready, which should be a couple of weeks after this session. Um, today's session will uh, presentations will run until roughly one o'clock when we'll take a five minute comfort break and we'll then return for our panel discussion until 10 to 2. Um, a question and answer session will follow at 1.50 um, where you will have the opportunity to ask questions of the panel and you can do this via the question and answer box which you'll see on your screens hopefully at the top right. Um, I think that's all I need to say so without further ado I'd like to introduce you to our first presenters. Um, we are joined today by Jane Sprout, Assistant Director of the Virtual Ward Programme, and her colleague Zoe Harris, Senior Delivery Manager at the Transformation Directorate, NHS England and NHS Improvement. Jane and Zoe will be beginning at the beginning, which is a great place to start, um, explaining what a virtual ward is and examining the scope of different models and the range of ways in which they can be implemented. Over to you, Jane and Zoe. Thank you so much. And it's a great kind of uh, place to start right at the beginning, as Lisa was kind of saying. So yes, um, I'm Jane. I'm the Assistant Director in the Virtual Ward Programme, which is a national NHS England programme. And I think many of you will already know there's a cascade of kind of like different um, levels across the national and regional team. So there is a growing team of teams that are supporting the implementation of virtual wards. And we'll touch on just some of those today. Next slide, please. And if we skip on to the next one. So what we're going to cover in the next 20 minutes is going to be rapid fire. We're not going to cover everything, but I think that kind of gets the perfect place to start. Uh, we'll also kind of make sure our contact details are in um, the uh, kind of like the, the chat and also how you can keep connecting for, from uh, with us across the journey that you're going to go on. So we're going to look at where we are now. Where do we get to and um, why virtual wards? What challenges were we trying to address? What is a virtual ward? Because I think there's still some kind of like confusion around definitions and having a clear starting point is fantastic. And then I'm going to hand over to Zoe, who's going to walk through the virtual wards enabled by technology and really looking at why um, having technology at the heart of some of this really is about empowering both staff and patients uh, within a virtual ward service. What's coming next? And the most important one is how can you keep involved? Next slide, please. 
So we have plans in place across every ICS. So they have been um, submitted to us and funding has gone out to each system. Um, and we're collectively across England supporting more people each month. So around 10,000 people can be supported within the current virtual ward capacity. So that's over 6,900 virtual ward beds. Now, when we say beds, we need to kind of like think about that in context that it's not the same as a hospital bed. It's about your caseload, about the cohort of patients that you've got so that does flex a little bit but over 200 services reporting activity and we're aiming that to increase this um, by December 2022 so there's a possibility of being able to support nearer to 20,000 people which is incredible for a program of work um, and services that have been in place many less than eight months so huge thank you from um, from us nationally for everything that's um, been focused on within your systems so as we said the capacity is growing and um, we're seeing that kind of like increase in every two weeks that we get the national kind of like reporting that the systems are kind of like are doing um, and we have looked at kind of like how we can support additional capacity through the um, urgent emergency care um, capacity and demand for winter this year but we know that there's also data quality issues so we may think that we're um, we might be in a better position than what the data is actually telling us so it's going to be a really interesting time over the next couple of um, weeks. Since, since May, the increase is roughly around 3% and we still have some uh, further submissions before December uh, when we kind of like take stock and kind of like reset for the new year. But what we do know is that occupancy is increasing. So since these slides were created, we're now at 52%. So that's growing, which is fantastic. But that does mean that there is a huge opportunity for us to focus on increased referrals from um, wider kind of like points, single points of access, primary care, same day emergency care and urgent community response alongside 111 and 999 care homes and hospital referrals. So there's lots of opportunity within this space already sitting within our grasp. Next slide, please. And why do we need to think differently? So obviously we have huge challenges around capacity and demand nationally. Um, and when you look at some of the King's Fund um, work that they were sort of like saying that actually the total number of hospital beds in England has more than halved over the past 30 years. Uh, and so actually whilst the number of patients that we are treating has increased in, uh, sufficiently. So we have kind of like looked at more efficient ways of working, but we still need to support that growth. Urgent emergency care services are really challenged at the moment. I don't think you can go anywhere without realising that actually every element of kind of um, the health services are challenged right now. Uh, and so we do need to think about something different that shifts from our normal ways of working. We made a promise to kind of like shift care closer to home within the long term plan. And this is kind of like part of acting on that. And we also know that winter is going to be really challenging. So actually, if we can support with additional capacity in systems safely uh, and at the right time, then it's obviously something that we would all be collectively keen to do. Next slide, please. And when we start to look at the benefits of virtual wards, now these are a growing evidence base, so they're, they're not a new service, but they may not have been established in all areas across the country. So this is something that we're learning together on. And um, quite often you hear Vindawak, who's our medical director, saying we need to do something different now and we need to act on um, kind of like a growing evidence base, but we need to learn as we go in and work out what doesn't work at the same time and be able to share that. So we have got that base there and you can find some more details on the evidence base on the Virtual Wards Futures workspace which I'll put the details into the chat. Um, but what we need to kind of look at at the moment is patient and safe and, um, staff experience is key in our early learning. So we hear, are already hearing that patients on a virtual wards have comparable, if not better outcomes than those treated in hospital. Uh, we know that they kind of like benefit from greater choice, personalised care and being closer to kind of like to family. And I don't know whether or not anybody caught up on our carers commutative practice last week, but hearing a carer talking about um, how wonderfully he obviously looks after his wife, but the difference that it made from her being admitted 16 times last year down to three times this year and being a partner in her care delivery. So everything was done with them uh, and actually kind of like made them, I think, just more, much more empowered around their own decisions that affected both of their lives. 
And obviously there's also staff benefits. So new training, career development opportunities. So with kind of like change comes a real opportunity for something slightly different. But we're going to continue to evaluate the impact on virtual wards. So this is only the start. So you'll hear from some teams today who are already on their journey and we're starting to learn from them. But we will look in at much more of a robust uh, evaluation strategy that's around the quantitative analysis process evaluation, real synthesis of the activity data that we're getting through and also um, hopefully uh, some interest around academic research. Next slide, please. So what is a virtual ward? So when we are talking about a virtual ward from the national um, perspective, we're talking about a virtual ward is a safe and effective alternative to NHS bedded care. Virtual wards support patients who would otherwise be in hospital to re receive the acute care and treatment that they need in their own home. And so this looks at both preventing avoidable admission, so admission alternatives, and also early supported discharge. And I think it is the acuity and complexity of patients' conditions that really makes a virtual ward different from other community or virtual care services. So there's a space for all of this together, but this is offering something different than what's already um, in place. It's providing urgent access to hospital level diagnosis. So you start to see point of care testing and point of care ultrasounds. Um, alongside treatments such as IV therapies, oxygen therapy. Um, it's actually quite impressive when you speak to some of the teams and I think you'll get a flavour of that through some of the presentations today. Next slide. Just going to listen to a quick video from one of the virtual ward teams at NNUH. Your respiratory rate is fine, your oxygen levels are perfect. They're 96%, so absolutely perfect. They can't get much better than that, no. I felt violently sick and uh, woke up and said to my wife, help, I need your help now. Um, the next thing I knew was that there was the ambulance crew there. The bed was dreadfully uncomfortable. The noise was constant, monitors beeping. It was, I think it was more depressing than anything. So that's where they offered us the situation of coming home on the virtual ward. One of the pieces of equipment and uh, it monitors your heart rate, your temperature and um, your oxygen levels. So it's um, quite good. Uh, I've got to take this off. And then you have to put this back on, which is your blood pressure monitor. You've got really good um, staff. You know, if, if you have staff that are just doing it for the money, I don't think it's uh, the same. Should they, the, uh, the impression I get is they're doing it because they care. Brilliant. And I think kind of like you hear that kind of like final kind of thing. It's because people care. And we do hear from nurses in some of the rapid evaluations, somebody describes this as, as old fashioned nursing with the use of technology. And actually people are really enjoying um, doing something slightly different, um, but valuing that use of technology and face-to-face uh, -face care delivery. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly go over this because I think we've kind of like touched on it and I think as you go through the presentations later on today you'll start to see that this is about a continuum this is not about digital only it's about comb a combination of valuing the use of technology alongside face-to-face -face care delivery so we have some pathways that will be more remote so they will look at using personalized remote monitoring um, with self-management and escalation pathways that are in place and they may be more aligned to the acute respiratory infection kind of pathways where patients patients uh, um, have got a confirmed or suspected acute respiratory infection, but they're stable and proven and they're not living with um, moderate or severe frailty, but they need that ongoing monitoring and that clinical kind of like oversight. But then you have the other end of the spectrum and you have frailty. So a lot often called hospital at home, where it is very much a hybrid approach to using digital monitoring technology um, to support consultation and face to face care delivery to support the patient's acute needs. Uh, I think that's also kind of like very important that the, the right care assessments, the intervention planning and face to face support is in place. And it is, as we kind of like said earlier, it's about delivering acute level interventions. Uh, so complex care at home. Next slide. 
And just want to touch on the national ambitions. We touched on it earlier that we're kind of like we're operating at pace now, but this is based on planning guidance. If you haven't seen the planning guidance, and I hadn't until I started to work in a regional or national team, I didn't know that these things existed when I was a ward nurse. So actually having a look at the planning guidance is quite interesting. So within the planning guidance, there is um, an ask that systems um, are asked to develop comprehensive plans and deliver virtual ward capacity. It's the equivalent of 40 to 50 virtual ward beds per 100k population. Now that kind of like is the size of a small district general hospital. So this isn't small, but it needs to kind of like have um, real pathway working across systems to be able to make sure that this kind of like maximizes bed capacity uh, and kind of like looking at this being a service that is embedded in um, system ways of working. Next slide, please. Going to hand over to Zoe now, who'll give you a little bit more of a flavour of the um, technology enablement and the opportunities that this brings. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and just first to say, um, my name is Zoe Harris. Um, I'm proud to, to say that I um, have been in nursing in the NHS um, for over 30 years. And um, during the pandemic, I led on the development of a virtual ward um, in Leicestershire. So um, my role was a long term condition lead and we built capacity and capability within an existing team, um, which led to uh, recurrent funding of 100 beds um, in that particular pro provider organisation. Um, I'm currently working with the digital health team in the transformation directorate um, and I'm also a work stream lead um, for technology enablement as part of the core virtual ward team. OK, so what are virtual wards enabled by technology? Um, in its purest sense, technology enablement is the care of patients um, using technology, including a digital platform, which is managed remotely by a clinical team. Now, you previously heard Jane describe two um, particular clinical pathways, acute respiratory infection and frailty, and what a patient who is um, being cared for in a virtual ward enabled by technology. The top um, box that you can see there is the clinical equipment that they will receive. So you can see that it's got a tablet, it has got clinical peripherals, and also there's a wearable in that particular um, example. So the patient at the bottom um, called David um, is wearing a wearable and you saw that in the video that that can monitor respiratory rate, body temperature and pulse. Um, and so, so that information and that data is then sent via a app or website um, and the information is received by the clinical team who see the measurements for their cohort of patients via the dashboard. The really important thing is that the, the clinical teams are able to have a look at the patients that they are caring for. They can care for larger numbers of patients because they are alerted when each person's recordings move outside of the range that have been um, agreed and are um, appropriate for that person, enabling them to take appropriate um, action. OK, next slide, please. OK, so this is a little bit more detail in relation to how the technology works. Um, and my experience um, of, of setting up a, a virtual ward in Leicestershire is that um, support for the patient and the carer are fundamental, both at the time of um, being set up on the virtual ward, but also ongoing. And that's both from a technical and from a clinical perspective. So we um, had a step down model, which um, Jane described earlier, and that was where patients were transferred into the virtual ward following a hospital stay. Um, we were based in the community and we um, developed a role whereby our um, healthcare assistants went into the hospital to identify and set up the patient. Um, they would receive the clinical equipment at the time of transfer and they would also um, have access with their first submission to the web based application. Um, that was really fundamental in terms of the expectation of both patients and carers um, and being cared for in this, these new and different ways. So um, in terms of the setup, uh, as I said, patients and their carers receive personalised support to set up the technology. Um, they should also receive um, written user guide, including contact details um, for the service. Um, we talked about before um, different methods and approaches for using technology as part of your virtual ward, and we describe them as continuous or spot monitoring. 
continuous is via the wearable that you saw David wearing in the picture before um, and spot monitoring is where the patient is um, submitting their data at predetermined and agreed um, times during the day um, and they know that when their clinical team will be receiving that information and what will happen as a result of that. So in terms of monitoring, um, a management plan is agreed with um, the patient and their carers, which um, will include not just the vital signs being um, monitored, but also they may be asked symptom based questions. So thinking about the respiratory pathway, it could be um, how is your breathlessness compared to yesterday? Have you been able to complete your activities of daily living? Um, and this will um, carry on as the um, as the care is provided in the virtual ward. This information and data is then transferred to the clinical pathway where in our system it was red, amber, green. So we were able to focus on the patients that were flagging as red, enabling the clinical teams to take prioritisation of action. OK, um, next slide, please. OK, so as Jane mentioned before, um, virtual wards um, have benefits, of course, um, and from a technology enabled perspective, we have categorised these into three um, main benefits. Um, I'm going to start with number three because I think most importantly, it's about um, improving patient experience. Um, you heard from the gentleman in the clip um, how it supports um, safe and earlier transfer of patients from hospital, enable, enabling them to be at home with their loved ones, eat their own food, um, being in their own homes with their pets, their, their, their families. Um, and I think we cannot underestimate how important that is as somebody is recovering from, from, from um, a hospital stay. Um, patients have increased confidence and reassurance as they absolutely know what to expect um, from the clinical team um, that they are connected with as part of their virtual ward care. And it increases safety, patient safety, um, reducing risks, for example, of um, hospital acquired infections and other and other complications. OK, so um, it enables clinical and um, proactive clinical action. So there is reduced length of stay for patients transferred to a virtual ward. Um, going back to my experience in Leicestershire, um, we were able to um, have our clinical pathway, which was for um, acute respiratory infection, but also um, patients that um, had had COVID. Um, and we were able to flex our clinical, clinical pathway so we could admit patients that were on reducing um, amounts of oxygen, which meant that was really important to release inpatient capacity um, at that time. So that was really important. Um, also, absolutely a benefit that we found was unnecessary admissions could be avoided because our patients knew um, that they were connected to the clinical team and actually rather than um, if they had a problem or a complication, they could contact the clinical team um, rather than um, unexpected um, non-elective emergency admissions. I'm just going to move on to the next slide because I'm just conscious of time. OK, so what I've put here for you um, to have a look at is I think it's really important that you um, define your benefits. Um, from the beginning of your pathways and these are, we talk about the quadruple aim so that's um, improve patient outcomes, improve patient experience, lower cost of care and improved um, provider experience and I have put on here some examples of the emerging evidence um, and we have case studies um, to support um, the stories that we've given you the high level detail of here um, and I'll give you um, a link in a moment as to where you can access this information. Um, one thing that I did just want to highlight in relation to um, the non-elective emergency admissions, we found that in our virtual ward with the use of technology and our clinical pathway development, that there was a 50% reduction in non-elective emergency admissions. So there was something um, that was happening as a result of the virtual ward care following discharge that was different to usual care where patients were just um, discharged from the hospital and went home without the virtual ward. So I think um, it's really important to understand the benefits that you want to capture um, as part of your virtual ward um, development. OK, I'm just going to whiz on to the next slide, please. OK, so um, as Jane mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, Futures NHS um, 
uh, platforms and uh, websites. You've, there's loads of information on our innovation collaborative. There are podcasts, case studies, um, the opportunity to network and have um, a discussion. So um, I've put the links here in terms of joining that workspace um, and um, I would absolutely advocate that, that you do that because there is a wealth of um, information and support um, on there. I'm just going to hand back to Jane. Amazing and um, getting me and Zoe to talk in time is a pretty high achievement so um, thank you so much and we have just to really touch the surface on it if we go on to the next slide I think it's really about this is going to be something that we're going to continue to learn with you so anybody who may have been involved in some of the community to practice and the clinical reference group that actually supported us to develop um, the national CAVEC approach will know that the sessions are kind of like a really vibrant um, please do kind of like come along. So it's really about kind of like continuing to stabilise. So focus on keeping focus on virtual wards, no change in the planning uh, for next year, keeping connected across national, regional and systems to support local imp implementation, really energised. So actually the power of us all joining together and sharing good practice, sharing our challenges is kind of like really kind of a like key uh, and then starting to kind of like realise the benefits of this. So understanding what that evaluation is showing us, focus on workforce development and and I think listening to what's going on and reacting to what you need in terms of support. So please do reach out to any of us in the national team and um, via your regional teams or directly through um, contacts on the website or the futures pages. Uh, we love to hear how you're doing, but also we're here to support you in whatever comes next. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jane and Zoe, for giving us such an excellent overview. Um, of the theory really of the virtual world and um, we move on now to show the virtual world in practice with some case study examples. Um, our first speaker um, for this session is Rebecca Ashworth who is the lead nurse at Adokla and she will be discussing the crucial aspect of safety in a virtual world, um, improving care and the un unsung benefits. So over to you, Rebecca, and thank you. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for having me and um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yes, my name is Becky. I am a lead nurse uh, for clinical engagement and clinical safety officer at DOCLA, which is a virtual ward company. Um, to give you some context, my background is I started in acute care, I moved into research, I've done research for both NHS and private, and then I moved into work for, for Dockler, which is where I have my um, remote patient monitoring experience. Um, and from that experience, my aim today is to talk to you about maintaining patient safety, how virtual wards can improve patient care and some of the unsung benefits um, of virtual wards. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that was my first slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, so I will start with a disclaimer. Obviously, I am biased because I work for Doc Club, so there are other virtual world providers available. And ultimately, I am a nurse, so patient care will always um, come first for me. So I'll give a very brief um, intro to what Doc Club do, just so you have an idea of where my experience comes from. So we are the provider of an end-to-end -end virtual ward service. So we take responsibility for all the devices. We are completely device agnostic. We take responsibility in terms of calibration, testing the devices, and then we also um, take care of all the logistics. So sending out the kits, maintaining the kits, collection of the kits, etc. Um, as part of our service, we have a an app which we supply on a pre-configured mobile phone that's involved in that's included in all of our patient kits, and we send this out to patients. Um, we like to there is an app that you can download, but we prefer to do it this way because it allows for some kind of control of the environment. It helps us support patients who aren't quite as tech savvy, um, and it's always supplied with a SIM card, so it can be used. Um, almost all through the UK. I'm not allowed to say everywhere, but almost everywhere. Um, as part of the service, we also have a clinician web portal. 
So this is a portal that can be accessed via any URL. The clinicians will log onto the dashboard and then they can see an overview of their patients. Um, the key features of this dashboard is that, as been mentioned, the alarms are for us as well, red, amber, green, and the dashboard will prioritise patients in terms of the red, amber, green alarms. Um, we also have the feature to be able to calculate the news 2 score on our dashboard as well. And then finally, we found that one of the main barriers to scaling virtual wards is that there just isn't the clinical capacity. So we are now CQC registered and it's not mandatory at all, but if it's needed, we can provide clinical support. Um, this is this is where my experience with remote monitoring has come from. Um, we provide pathways that are both community and acute. We've got pathways um, from respiratory, which is just perfect for virtual wards. We've got UTI pathways, diabetes, etc. Um, yes, and the idea is that we provide a support layer to everything that we can to um, to overcome the barriers to scaling virtual wards. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So. How do virtual wards improve patient care? The obvious one is that we want to keep patients out of hospital and there's obvious reasons for this. Patients go into hospital, uh, they can uh, contract healthcare acquired infections. We know that older patients are more likely to deteriorate when they go into hospital. So it really is, um, it really is, we want to keep patients out of hospital um, and recover at home when it's safe to do so. And a really good example of this is, um, so one of the, the, my experiences was on an acute pathway and um, we had a patient who was quite anxious. We were discharging her onto a long-term respiratory pathway and we kept her on over the weekend. She was perfectly stable to be discharged, but she herself said, I always call 999 when I get worried or I go into A&E. So for the sake of a nurse, um, just click Taking on some readings and saying yes they're okay um, just prevented her from seeking emergency care um, over the weekend and then we could discharge her onto the long-term service. Um, as has already been mentioned, virtual wards offer that direct line of communication between the patient and the clinician. I did a quality improvement report for one of our clients on that asthma pathway and this was a really good example of this. So when the patients were, if they did end up in hospital, even if they went in for a broken leg, they would be seen by an asthma specialist, they'd be given the contact number and then after that, if they did have an exacerbation of their asthma, they could self-refer onto the service. When they're on the service, one of my favourite features was it's such a simple one, but when you have built up that rapport with the patient, because obviously it's unfamiliar for them when they're on the service for the first few days. So I would keep up, I'd keep up communication with them. But once they got used to the routine, I would say to them, if your readings are stable, what I'll do is I'll send an acknowledgement receipt. So you know that I've seen them, but we don't need to have a conversation about them. And this was a way of just offering that reassurance, but it really saved so much time for the clinician. And on the same kind of line of thinking, if we imagine um, trying to get hold of a clinician to have a conversation, if you're a patient, often you'll call up, you'll be on press option one, press option two, you can be in the queue waiting for the clinician, then they're not there, they call you back, the patient's gone to the lyrics or something, so you end up in this sort of um, trying to catch each other. On the dashboard and on the pre-configured app, patients can send a message through to the clinician and say, well, could you give me a call at some point today? I've just got a question about this. And the clinician can give them a call back. There's been times when I've asked patients um, if we're weaning them off oxygen, or could you do your reading? Could you just turn your oxygen down at 11.30 and then submit your reading at 12? And it just helps with the routine of managing that care. And then as we have mentioned, virtual wards is a replacement for hospital monitoring, but it can also be used to um, add in an extra layer of safety. So one of the clients that I work with is a rapid response team, and they've actually chosen to go with the idea of every patient goes on to remote monitoring as default, unless it's something obvious like blocked catheter that, blocked catheter that wouldn't be suitable. But the idea is that we put patients on as default and then if they are to deteriorate we can catch that as early as possible and try and prevent them from going into hospital. Uh, next slide please. Thank you. So um, this slide is um, sort of Hopefully some practical tips from my experience with remote monitoring, but also coming from my role as clinical safety officer as well. So I've often found that the, the nurses who were on the front line doing the using the virtual ward, they haven't necessarily been involved in the, the work behind the scenes that, that makes the service as safe as possible. 
So before the service is to go live, my uh, one of my strong tips would be to define your clinical processes. In particular, for example, if you have a patient at home that you're looking after and they require a change in medication, who's going to be responsible for making that change in medication and how are we going to get that medication to the patient? Sometimes it can be you can send a prescription to their local pharmacist. They might have a member of family who can go and get that prescription, but it's something that um, is really useful to think about, think about beforehand, think about the things that could go wrong, and then you've got your plan Bs and plan Cs. The second point, oh, sorry, no, but to say on the defining clinical processes, a really important one to have is in your escalation procedures as well. If a patient is to deteriorate, do we escalate to a, so the service that I was with was a GP that held responsibility for all the virtual patients, but some of our other clients will escalate to the specialty at the acute hospital. So it's really important to have that in process and also make that information available to all the nurses that will be using that service. The second point perhaps is uh, more, more relevant maybe for myself. So when I was uh, monitoring patients, I'm based in London. I was looking after patients that were elsewhere in the UK. And when you call an ambulance for a patient um, that's somewhere else in the UK, you need to know where their locality is because you go straight through to the London Ambulance Service. It's also really important to know um, what their nearest hospital is, but also to know where they get their hospital care as well, because those can be two different things. It's handy to know um, where their GP is registered because that can impact the services that are available to them, which links quite nicely onto the next point. It's good to know before you go live the local referral pathways, what services are available in that area. The really nice thing about the remote monitoring that I did before with one of our clients is that I was taking res clinical responsibility for the patients, but if I needed a point of care test or if I thought, you know what, this patient really needs to be seen face to face in person, I could link in with the community nurses and talk to them and ask them if they could go and say hello to my patient and do a point of care test. During the service or when we first start, it's so important to start small. I will happily say when I started looking after these patients, they were more sick than I anticipated and they took up more time than I thought they would. We initially started with our acute patients, um, a ratio of one to 10, so one nurse to 10 patients. We've reduced that down to about five to eight. We did find that when they went on to moderate or mild pathways that you could, have, you could look after quite a lot of patients. But when they initially come out to maintain safety, I would definitely recommend start small and find out what your capacity is and work up from there. I've asked, as I've said before, start the remote monitoring as early as possible. This allows the patients to get familiar with the routine if their family want to be involved or friends are involved and also just means that we detect deterioration as early as possible. Always repeat safety net advice. I would say each time I came off the phone with a patient, I would say to just remind them, this isn't an emergency service. This is the red flags I need you to watch out for. If you do need help immediately, call 999. We have a team of customer service agents with our service as well, and they will also repeat to the patients. It's not an emergency service, the patient leaflet that you got in the book. That's the number for the clinician if you need it, et cetera, et cetera. I think the more people that can be involved in the patient's care, um, they each add their own layer of safety. So when I was looking after patients, I'd often be talking to the next of kin. I had one patient where it was a neighbour that was involved as well. And just educating the patient themselves and the people that they're happy, they're, they've consented to be involved just adds in that extra layer of safety. It's just another person that can contact you if they have concerns. And most importantly, whichever your virtual ward provider is, maintain regular contact throughout the life cycle of the service. One of the things that I've learned is that my knowledge is just is within my nursing remit. So when I can have conversations with my tech colleagues or when we talk to clients, it can be this is annoying. It's impacting the service. The referral pathway is annoying. Sometimes there's a tech solution that we just wouldn't have even thought of. So it's really important to talk about near misses, incidents, little things that are annoying just to keep continuing to improve the service. I've included the DCB standards on this. This isn't something that necessarily everybody needs to be aware of but I've put it there just if someone if you want to give it a quick google essentially these are the legal requirements that us as the manufacturer and also the NHS as the user have to adhere to to make sure that the services are safe. Uh, next slide please. 
So these next couple of slides are the ones that get me a little bit excited in terms of I completely understand that we need virtual wards because we need to free up hospital beds. That is, we are in a crisis and it also hopefully helps utilise resources better as well. But there are some incredible benefits for the patients that I just don't want to uh, that I want to shed some light on. So improved sleep quality. Um, so I usually use the example of there's not many adults that I would know that voluntarily share a room with strangers when they're at their most sickest and require hospitalisation. We know that just even one night in an unfamiliar bed will reduce sleep quality and we know that this has a direct impact on their immunity. So if we can keep patients at home where they're in a comfortable environment, this will help towards their recovery. Maintaining nutrition, we're all quite well aware of how important that is in terms of recovery and wound healing. We all have different circadian rhythms. So when a patient goes into hospital, they have their breakfast at half eight, they have their lunch at 12, they have their dinner at five. Not everybody adheres to this routine outside of work, outside of hospital, sorry. And um, and it's if they're at home, they have access to their own nutrition. They have access to um, whenever they want to eat their home cooked food. Maintaining access to their family and their social network. Again, I feel like this is a fairly obvious one, but if we think about things like they can stay connected to uh, to the family, to their social circle, um, they can have hugs and skin to skin contact, and all this will go to support their mental well-being um, during their recovery. I th it's obvious as a privacy. We know in hospital um, curtains don't aren't sound barriers. If they're at home, um, it can be more private for them as well. Virtual wards offer an amazing opportunity to empower patients to self-manage their conditions. Um, the quality improvement project that I did with asthma was a perfect example of this. As part of that, I did a mini thematic analysis of the patient testimonials and the words that often came up was they felt, felt safe, they felt reassured, they had an understanding of what their readings meant and the impact of those on their asthma. Um, and that leads nicely onto the next point in that when patients can stay at home, they can still continue their activity of daily living. We had one patient who were, really didn't want to go into hospital because she didn't know how she was going to organise childcare. Um, and she also had work responsibilities and she managed to maintain these because she avoided hospital admission because we could monitor at home. There's also the additional idea of if, for example, if we have a patient on a, they could be on a UTI pathway, they could be on an asthma pathway, um, but we can add on extra um, extra things to, to help towards help promote health promotion. So it's a very easy facility to send out a group message to say there's a high pollen count, it's hot weather, cold weather, but we've also started working on smoking cessation pathways. Um, it could be that there's an additional um, weight loss pathway that we can add on to those services as well. We have also found that when patients have been on the services, they've actually gone on to buy the devices afterwards because they've learned about the importance of what those readings mean and they've become more engaged in their health. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So in the future, uh, virtual wards offer amazing opportunities for new devices. I've been lucky enough to go to um, a couple of conferences where there is people showing their ideas. So a few months ago I went to an asthma conference and there was someone that had a prototype for a completely new way of doing spirometry, um, much cheaper than um, much cheaper than the current spirometry machines that are used. Um, I would imagine in five, ten years time, virtual wards will look completely different to how they are now. There will be wearable devices that can reliable, reliably detect readings from a, a, a range of um, a range of sources. Um, my next point, a new nurse and speciality, unfortunately I can't take credit for this idea, but I think this is such an amazing forum to raise it in. Um, I was speaking with a client a few months ago and they mentioned that could nurse, could remote patient monitoring be its own speciality? So the reality of monitoring patients at home is, um, as I mentioned, I'm based in London, I live in a studio, so my commute to work was about three metres from my bed to the table. So I was able to get more sleep. I was able to eat my own home cooked food. 
the and the remote patient monitoring is not physically demanding it just involves sharp assessment skills and it involves excellent problem solving skills so there might be a variety of reasons why nurses want to move away from the more physically demanding role. Um, it's completely understandable that as they move towards the end of their career, they might not want to do 12, 13 hour shifts on the ward, but they will have this wealth of knowledge and experience that would be so useful for remote patient monitoring. It could be that we take that one step further in that perhaps there's a completely new way of training nurses. Um, there are some people that aren't physically able to do traditional nurse training, but there are people who could be who are more than capable of making clinical assessments and clinical decisions. Could it be that we have a completely new education for just for remote patient monitoring? And staying on the idea of education, um, do we need to start looking in the near future about having students in the digital space? Um, it's excellent communication skills are needed. They would develop communication skills, their assessment skills and also their problem solving skills as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in summary, I hope I've shown that um, the potential of virtual wards in the near and um, distant future as well. So virtual wards, virtual wards present an opportunity to improve patient care. Uh, they absolutely can be safe so long as all um, all safety deliverables, safety activ activities are, are completed. Um, they can be used to support self-management and health promotion and they offer really exciting opportunities for new devices that will benefit patients. Um, and next slide please. Thank you. Um, so I've included my email there. I look forward to any questions that might uh, that might come. Please do email me with any questions as well. And also on the doctor.com website, there's a resources page where um, we've published some white papers and some more evidence towards the work that we do with our clients. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Rebecca, for your presentation. Um, that was great. Thank you um, for highlighting the um, benefits to patients, um, the need for human contact still with the virtual world and also the essential role of clinicians, um, intelligence and interpretation. That was very useful. Thank you. I'm going to move on now to our second case study, um, a joint presentation here on um, the dreaded C word, the implementation outcomes of a COVID-19 virtual world. Um, we have two speakers, Dr. Hein LaRue, uh, GP at Churchdown Surgery, Quality Improvement Lead, 1 Gloucestershire ICS, Deputy Medical Director, NHS England South West. Joined by Sophie Ailano, Contract Manager for Baywater Healthcare. You're both very welcome. Please pre start your presentation. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm Sophie Alano. I'm the contract manager at Baywater Healthcare, and I'm also joined by um, Dr. Hein LaRue uh, from Gloucestershire, um, who will be taking any questions from um, yourselves um, at the end. Next slide, slide, please. So just a little bit about Baywater Healthcare. So we are a specialist provider of in-home respiratory services across the UK. We have around 40,000 patients on our books um, with over a million patient interactions per annum. On the right hand side, you can see some of the accreditations that you would expect to see from any in-home provider. And to the left at the bottom are services which we provide are um, 365 days a year, 24-7, um, which includes a, a helpline and, and a DBS checked technicians that go into patients' homes. So we were obviously talking about virtual wards. That's one of the topics um, of this year. Um, and we worked collaboratively with, well, we are working collaboratively with Gloucestershire ICS on the COVID-19 virtual ward. Um, this isn't the only virtual ward we provide and we've heard from um, other speakers this morning um, around um, different pathways that can be achieved and patient safety, which is, is great. Um, next slide, please. So the objectives of the COVID-19 virtual ward, um, one of them was obviously to look at early intervention for the patients with silent hypoxia and to make sure that they received the treatment and support um, that they needed, hopefully in their own homes. 
Um, we utilised reporting tools that were used already within the NHS, um, which identified patients who uh, were positive of COVID-19. And the um, GDOC um, clinical nurses and doctors who, who monitored these patients over in Gloucestershire uh, would refer into the service and work collaboratively with our long term conditions team to make sure that everybody was um, onboarded safely and successfully. Um, there was inclusive access across the whole of the county, um, so we worked with all care services, um, learning disabilities included, um, out of hours, primary care, rapid response um, and, and acute services as well. Um, it was safe, it was easy um, and we'd got a quick onboarding process for patients. The implementation process, um, we actually implemented and executed the service in 14 days, not working days, actual days. So myself, Hein, some of the other clinicians from Gloucestershire and the stakeholders um, put together this service uh, actually a year today, uh, two years today, sorry, um, to successfully make sure that we could monitor as many patients as we could um, in their own homes. Um, it was exciting. It was extremely challenging at times. Um, and we did actually work around the clock, um, communicating between each other via mobile phones, text messaging, any way we could possibly get hold of each other to make sure that it was safe for patients, that what we were doing was right. We were following government guidelines. We were ensuring that clinical teams were involved in every step of the way and that these patients um, were supported if they needed to be admitted or if they needed to be discharged early. Next slide, please. So just a service overview. So these numbers have slightly changed now. So two years today, um, we started the service um, very quickly, uh, executed it and had patients on the ward. We've now seen over 7,400 patients in that time and, and we're still going. Um, numbers are obviously a little bit lower now um, with obviously not many people testing anymore, but we're still seeing numbers churning through the ward. Obviously, as we've mentioned, all the patients were, were COVID positive um, and GDOC, who are based over in Gloucestershire, which is the centralised hub um, who started monitoring these patients and, and still are, did an absolutely fantastic job. They worked around the clock um, monitoring the alerts, which are based on a RAG rated system, so red, amber, green. Um, and we obviously moved with government guidelines and the, and the changes that, that came with that um, over that period. So they, they were on the service for 14 days to start with, which obviously, as you all know, was later reduced to 10 days. Um, the patients were referred fr from anywhere and everywhere. Um, they could self-refer if needs be, um, and it was done via a, a simple referral form, um, or we could take them over the phone, which we do for most of our services um, from a clinician. All of the non-compliance alerts were monitored by uh, our long-term conditions team over at Baywater Healthcare. So this meant that a lot of noise in the system that the clinicians were seeing, so where patients weren't entering data in their schedules or there was a, a technical issue that they couldn't seem to resolve themselves, Baywater Healthcare took all of that burden off the clinical team. So they were literally just doing what they, they, they needed to do, which was monitor those patients who, who really needed them. So the service as a whole, what happened was the patients were referred in. Um, they were emailed out a, a link with a login or password, um, which then took them to a, a web version of the patient application. Um, the whole onboarding process, we started with the clinicians um, first doing this process, um, but it was taking uh, roughly about 20 minutes per phone call per phone call to onboard these patients and vital clinical time was being wasted. So Baywater Healthcare took that on and every referral that came through, we were the people that first spoke to this patient. Um, any patients that, that couldn't um, have the link emailed to them, a uh, Baywater Healthcare technician would go out to the patient's address and install either a tablet or a smartphone at a two metre distance or on a three way call or with a carer. Um, and, and leave the peripherals that were needed for that patient as well. So everybody was included. Next slide, please. Um, so to start with, the patients were asked to enter data four times a day. Um, they completed some wellbeing questions, a short questionnaire, um, just to make sure that they were um, doing OK. Um, this was later reduced to uh, twice daily, so in the morning and in the afternoon. 
Um, the thresholds that were set obviously were followed by NICE guidelines and government guidelines for silent hypoxia. Um, and if we needed to change these on a patient by patient basis, either our admin team um, at Baywater Healthcare would do this or GDOC were also given um, the administration rights to the service so that so they could do it on their clinical dashboard as well. Um, a lot of the patients received it pulse oximeters through the post, so we used a, a next day courier service um, to ensure that the patients were getting their pulse oximeters pretty much immediately. Um, they could also collect them from their local satellite points that we worked collaboratively with Gloucestershire to sort those out so they could have been the GP. Um, we used a volunteer service at one point um, where patients could have either collect them from their hub or the volunteer would go out and post them. And as mentioned before, the patients that didn't have their own technology, Baywater Healthcare provided that for them um, and patients that really couldn't use it. I think we had about a 12 percent rate of patients that couldn't use technology at all. Baywater Healthcare rang them daily, seven days a week um, to take these readings from the patients over the phone. So the service as a whole was completely um, inclusive to make sure that anybody could be referred um, and anybody was able to submit these readings and have the support and help that they needed. Next slide, please. So we just wanted to share some of our patient feedback with you. Um, as I mentioned before, it, at the beginning, it was very challenging. Um, it was um, very exciting as well. But some of the feedback that we've received from patients has been um, heart, heartwarming, to be honest, um, and just shows what a, a good service um, we've both done together, Gloucestershire ICB and Baywater Healthcare. Um, lots of patients have thanked us, um, explained that their anxiety has been lower, the fact that they could stay in their own homes, um, as we've met, all mentioned on the call today. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Just a few more quotes there. Uh, everything was explained well. It was easy to enter uh, the readings. Um, support was great. And that's from both services, the clinical aspect and obviously from, from Baywater Healthcare as well. Next slide, please. So just in summary, um, what we've provided together is uh, an easy to use virtual ward for both patients, clinicians, carers. Um, we've reduced hospital beds where it wasn't clinically needed. Um, as I mentioned before, we implemented a service within a two week turnaround. We work collaboratively around the clock, literally around the clock with Gloucestershire to ensure that we'd got a safe and effective service that worked. Uh, the service is still running today um, and will be until the foreseeable future. And uh, just one of the points that uh, Gloucestershire wanted to make was that we retained a consistent escalation rate of in between 18 and 22 percent of patients into secondary care. And this length um, of stay of admitted patients with sign of deterioration from the ward was much lower than the national average. So it just showed us that one of these outcomes was that the service works, the patients are safe. The clinicians can obviously monitor a, a vast amount of patients um, in shut actually on the ward at one time. I think uh, the highest number we had um, in peak season was over 800 patients on the ward at any one time, um, which obviously is a huge number. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, as always, um, it's been great for us to, to be here today um, for us to explain to you our, our service that we've done. Um, if anybody would like any more information, please don't hesitate to contact me over at Baywater Healthcare and again over to Hine at Gloucestershire if needs be. Um, and any questions you've got operationally or clinically for myself and Hine, if you pop them in the Q&A, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, um, Sophie, for that um, presentation. It seems COVID lent itself uh, by necessity of, of speed, um, speedy implementation. Um, and I think that came across very clearly. Um, we have some time before the break, um, which is at 1.05. So if I may, I will um, ask some questions um, from our attendees. Um, We've received a question asking, how do we move patients once they're better to discharge? And I, I wonder if um, Sophie or Dr LaRue would like to answer that question. Yeah, I can answer that. So um, from the COVID virtual ward, um, when people were 
uh, uh, had sort of not served their time, but spent their time on the virtual ward, and we knew they were safe from not getting uh, silent hypoxia, which was 10 days. We discharged them, uh, safety netted them, said, you know, obviously if you get worse or whatever, get, get in touch with your GP, and we just discharged them and sent an electronic uh, communication email with a, a, a summary to the GP just to let them know. Great. OK, thank you. Um, we've had a question from um, an attendee asking how virtual wards will benefit staff working in nursing homes um, and to access primary care when needed, where they have the nurses to do the monitoring and to access primary care when needed. Um, I wonder, um, clearly, uh, the virtual ward is in hospital care in the place that the patient calls home, which may well, of course, be a nursing home. Um, is that something that um, oh, Rebecca um, has jumped in here? So Rebecca, if you would like to answer that one, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, yes. Um, so we have developed um, a care home app version of our of our patient app. So the idea for this would be that um, the carer would be able to go around the nursing home, do the opposite they usually do, but only um, certain patients will be on the Doppler service and then those readings will get sent through to their primary care. So the clinicians can monitor those patients without having to do um, care home visits. Um, yeah, if that, if that so helps answer that question. Can I just come in? Yeah, so I think for routine care, that'd be really helpful. I think where people are unwell, say in a care home, and previously you might have thought about sending them to hospital. Actually, lots of care home residents don't want to go to hospital. Um, I think this way of working will allow them to be uh, monitored and kept safe in the care home. But what I'd say is, um, just thinking primary care has got the capacity to then step in and look after a whole lot of sicker patients is probably a bit unrealistic. I think we we really need to take primary care with us on this journey. And I think what Sophie and I found on our service was we engaged the GPs. The success of the model was because we've had over 6,000 people go through. That's largely from GP referrals. But then we sorted out the patients within the service and we didn't rely on the GPs to have to do anything. So they were very bought into that. That seems to be essential, doesn't it? That um, multidisciplinary working, which obviously we're going to be touching on in the panel discussion later. Um, another question here, going back to discharge, um, how patients feel um, about discharge, um, any anxieties, how you allay them? Um, open to um, the panel, to answer? Well, I'll, I'll say a few things and then other people can say things. Um, I think hopefully people are feeling better at the end of their spell or they've yes. been escalated to hospital, rightly so. Uh, but as we found from the COVID experience, lots of people didn't need to go into hospital. So I think uh, as other people have said, uh, they got all the benefits of being able to stay at home, the reassurance of knowing that they were being monitored. Uh, and then uh, as Sophie said about uh, Twenty percent ended up going into hospital, but the rest were feeling better um, uh, by the end, so were safe to be discharged. Right. Okay. Um, I have a question actually, um, which is people who are. Have you ever found? Have you found um, any instances where? the technology is not appropriate because of needing internet connection, which may be patchy in some areas, for example. Um, are you working with um, a, an urban or a rural community? Do these factors have to be taken into account when you're um, uh, deciding with the patient who will enter a virtual ward? No, that's a great, so, Lisa. great, go on, great question. Let Sophie answer it. OK, um, thank you, very, Sophie. 
Very much so, Lisa. Obviously, Gloucestershire, the Forest of Dean, was an absolute nightmare for Signal. Um, we yes. use a uh, multi-data uh, roaming SIM card, which sometimes doesn't even pick up those in, in the depths of the Forest of Dean anyway. Um, so those patients were called. Those patients, we've got a 24-hour um, 365 day a year long term conditions helpline. We rang those patients daily. We've got healthcare technicians that visited them in their homes and trained them and dropped off paper copies of the educational material. Um, and then the um, the long term conditions team input those readings into the clinician clinical database for the clinicians over at Gloucestershire to monitor them. Um, obviously, you can use Wi Fi if the patients have got Wi Fi at home, if they've got that supplied. That is something that Baywater Healthcare would um, do as well if needs be, fit Wi Fi into patients' homes um, should we need it. But obviously, the tackle around the COVID 19 pandemic was quick rush, get everybody in to, to, to monitor quite, quite sharpish. So um, a lot of that was done via phone calls um, to make sure that we were all inclusive. Yes, OK, thank I, you. I don't know if Rebecca's got anything to add, but I, I can just say so, you know, we've had over 6000 people go through the service, so we we, we know what we're doing now. But actually, uh, Sophie makes it sound really slick and that's because we've had great working relationships. Um, but, you know, as she said earlier on, it was quite hairy at times. And I think you've got to when people talk about continuous improvement, this would be an example of that where we were, you know, PDSA cycling rapidly, learning rapidly, things near misses, things that we, you know, you make assumptions. And actually, as Sophie said, it was evenings, it was weekends, and um, we had a lot of patients to, to deal with and a lot of stuff to learn. And so now we've got uh, sort of mature, robust processes, but we had to do that by building the aeroplane as we flew it. And so I think for the listeners, having great team dynamics and, you know, we actually had three different working teams uh, come together for the service, you know, us lot in the CCG, um, Baywater and then GDOC um, who were working and we had to work really closely together, but we never met each other. So um, just to say, if you get those relationships, the psychological safety, all the principles of patient safety, um, you could have a really great service. But if you get all the technology and everything else, but not the, the human element of it, you, you, you're putting a, a risk in. Yes, indeed. And just before we, we go to the break, anything you'd like to add, Rebecca? Um, yeah, just other than that, I completely agree with what's uh, just been said, and that has very much been our experience. We um, we have a team of agents who who do who bring in that human element that's really important to help uh, patients use the technology and help them get set up with Wi-Fi if they have it. But there are occasions where patients don't. There are rural areas, and then we have to start looking at other ways of doing it, calling the patients, but. As has been mentioned, that does bring in risks. So um, the importance is to make sure every time there is a change to a process or we do something differently, that we do a risk assessment to make sure that's safe, maintain communication between us and the clients and make sure that um, this, the, the service for the patients is still safe and, and high quality. I completely agree with what's just been said. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, OK, we will um, now just... break. Sorry. Um, what, one last thing. So obviously yes. I'm doing this role for NHS England and just to say there's a huge amount of learning that we can share with systems and between systems. And I think that would be my take home message from, you know, working with Sophie and the guys is share across the region because all the, the things we are learning, the good things, the, the bad things, you know, you could really shortcut your uh, lead times and really improve care a lot quicker if we were more collaborative. OK, so some fantastic resources available for people. Yeah, well, actually, everyone's learning as they go along. So, yes, it, yes to share stops and things, but actually to go well, we've, you know, one of the things we, we had to learn was, you know, people would say a learning disability and you might not know about that person uh, or where they're living. And actually, this would be common across the whole country and actually other places would have cracked it or worked out how to to do it and so there's there's really good learning you can share in real time okay thanks very much 
um, to all of our uh, presenters this morning for um, a great session. We'll take a short break, a comfort break. So uh, stand up, breathe deep, grab a drink, and we'll be back at 1.10 for a panel discussion. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, welcome back, everybody. Um, after that whistle stop break, um, we're on to the uh, second half, really, of our uh, virtual wards webinar, and this will be a panel discussion. Um, the panel will be formed of Gemma Bond, who is Director of Nursing and Quality at PHL Group, and Lucy Lewis, who is Consultant Practitioner clinical lead at Limington and New Milton Frailty Hub, Southern Health NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, the panel discussion will um, uh, comprise questions really from you as attendees um, to ask um, Gemma and Lucy. Um, so I will have a look at some of the questions that have come in um, and kick off. Yeah, actually, we touched on this at the end of the last session. What do we do if a patient does not have access to technology? So they don't have an app, a computer or a phone even. Um, what about the health inequalities that and uh, deprivation that we're aware of in um, particularly urban inner city environments? Um, do you have ideas um, or suggestions or examples of um, how that can be addressed? Uh, Gemma or Lucy, would one of you like to take that? I can I can take that question. So we supply technology to the patients in their home and the technology can consist of the behavioural monitoring sensors as well as the medical observations. And we also provide the telephone and the technology if it's not already in the patient's home. So we will provide a router that would be the um, connection to the internet um, that will pick up any internet provider signal. So it doesn't matter whether the patient has got a mobile phone, a home phone or Wi-Fi, we can provide the whole technology so no one is disadvantaged. Great, OK, thank you. And um, that doesn't um, that doesn't affect um, access in um, rural areas. At okay. all. There's been lots of testing and so there, there may be, we haven't tested obviously the whole country, but the router will pick up any, will go to any provider in that area. Right, OK, thank you. Um, someone has asked who provides personal care for patients on virtual wards? Um, given that access to social care um, is, is such an issue, um, and I, I wonder um, if perhaps Lucy, you might wish to take that. Yeah, so in our area, we have a really good relationship, established relationship with community reablement teams. So they're able to provide um, step up care for people in their homes who, because of their decompensation of frailty, are temporarily unwell so they're not where they normally are functionally so they're able to provide that care for them and um, so it's not necessarily for people who require long-term care but for people who need that up to six weeks to get them back on their feet really while they're having that um, acute illness. Right okay thank you. Um, have you had um, experiences of uh, patients refusing or to go into a virtual ward or withdrawing um, from a virtual ward. I guess it has to be um, a, a, a agreed, a collaboration. We've, we've spoken a lot about um, the importance of uh, multidisciplinary team working, but um, they're not going to be suitable for everybody. Um, and people have a right, presumably, to not 
um, join a virtual ward. So, uh, and what's the what would be the care for them? How do you decide, really? I guess who joins. I think the journey for the patient starts um, in multiple areas. It can be in the community when there's been a referral from um, intermediate care teams um, into virtual ward or in hospital, and it's the information. So pa these patients are making the informed consent. So if they don't understand the purpose of the virtual ward, the contact that's been happening, the equipment that might be in their home, um, it, they need to understand all that to make that informed consent. Also, we send people into their homes, as Rebecca alluded to as well, that giving them the information so they know what this equipment's for. So they've got um, supplementary information that they can read and understand, and that it's in language that is understandable to them, not with a lot of jargon. Um, even the technology teams that provide us with our equipment, some of their jargon I, I don't understand at all. So again, they have to explain these things in simple language that I can understand. So it is informed consent, understanding, information for, for these patients to make a decision. And um, that sounds reassuring if a person is living on their own um, and you're not assuming that they have a carer or a family member who will be able to do that for them. The majority of the patients that have gone through our care, virtual care and virtual wards have often lived on their own. Yes. OK, great. Um, moving down. Um, it, somebody has asked, does anyone have experience with um, diabetes and the virtual ward, especially people with type 1 diabetes? Um, I don't know if any of our panel will be able to speak to that. Yes, yeah, certainly um, we cover all long term conditions. We are a frailty virtual ward, but obviously what comes with that is that people will be living with lots of complexities and that will include decompensation of heart failure, a, a, a exacerbation of COPD and um, unstable diabetes, particularly if they have something like an infection, which is just um, kind of maybe tipped their blood sugars off um, for a short period of time. So yeah, so the day-to-day -day kind of run-of-the-mill um, insulin would be managed by either the, the person themselves or with um, our community nursing colleagues. But if it gets complex and they get to the stage where the um, blood sugars can become um, very high or very low, then that's when we would step in and we would support them with that in the short term. OK, so there is scope for the virtual ward to um, apply to patients with a variety of long term conditions. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, physios and occupational therapists. I know our nursing um, uh, colleagues are, are, are the implications for nursing are the focus of today, but um, physiotherapists and occupational therapists, are they involved in um, a virtual ward uh, team? And if so, how do they carry out their work? So in our team, um, we couldn't do our work without, we just couldn't provide the service that we do without it being multi-professional. And we have frailty practitioners who are from different uh, professions, so occupational therapy, physiotherapy, paramedics and nursing. And they, we all have work to um, some, the same competencies, frailty competencies, but then what happens is that people bring in their core profession. So if we need someone who's got specific needs around cognitive function assessments, then we'll ask one of our OTs to help us with that. Um, but at the same time, everybody in the team can do basic cognitive assessments, for example. And then as we get to our trainee advanced clinical practitioners and advanced clinical practitioners, regardless of what profession they've come from, they can can do um, your basic medical assessment and the beginnings of that urgent comprehensive geriatric assessment. And it's no different to what you would have in the front door of a hospital. And it's the beauty of having all these different professions working together and sharing our knowledge and our experience, which means that we can provide the service that we provide. OK, um, and the service provision of a virtual ward, um, somebody has asked, are they 24-7? Um, is there a difference in support um, 
demand overnight or at weekends. Um, obviously, that I guess will vary around the country. But um, would the panel have um, be able to share their their experiences of uh, service provision times, please? Yeah, Lisa, I think. Um not talking for all providers, but I think um, it's dependent on um, service to service. So we provide a 24-7, 365 day a year service for all of our therapies, be that ventilation patients or virtual ward patients. Um, I, I can't speak for everybody, but um, people are still poorly on a Saturday and a Sunday and a bank holiday. So a virtual ward needs to be available. Um, for those patients every day of the week, which obviously we found with our COVID virtual ward in Gloucestershire, um, you couldn't just run it Monday to Friday and expect the patients to just manage themselves on a Saturday and Sunday. So no. I think it's extremely important that when planning your virtual ward setup, you look at all avenues. I mean, light touch, which we also do for diabetic patients, doesn't necessarily need to be manned on a Saturday and Sunday. If the patient is required to enter data twice a week, and those, those two days are a Tuesday and a Thursday, and the patient has got an escalation process should they be poorly on a weekend or bank holiday, then, then fair enough. So I think it's planning your pathways and your processes around what your objectives are for uh, achieving your virtual ward. OK, I can see Rebecca and Lucy nodding there. So um, would you like to add anything to um, Sophie's experience? Um, yeah, so from a tech side of things, um, we will always mirror whatever hours our clients want, because if there is a clinician that's struggling to log into the dashboard at 11 p.m. at night, then they need to be able to call us and, and we can help them troubleshoot them with that. So even removing the clinical side of things from a tech side, we will always um, provide that support. And we at the moment are also um, every day, all year, um, and we mirror the, the hours of our of our client services as well. OK. And Lucy? Yeah, so quite different actually. And this is what we would be aspiring to. So at the moment we're just testing out um, digital health uh, technology to assist with our with our service. We're very much face to face at the moment. So everybody's face to face on a daily basis. Um, and we're, we're at the moment we're, we're actually only eight till six, seven days a week and we're we're moving to eight to eight in the new year, um, seven days a week. So it's we've probably got quite a long way to go and um, to, to meet um, what you guys are doing, actually. Yeah. OK, so uh, there isn't a, a one size fits all and there isn't a um, consistent um, pattern it, it sounds um, some services are at different stages of development would that be true to say yeah and I, and I think that what our team we've been going for five years now we haven't been called virtual wards we've been going since January 2017 so that's actually a bit longer than five years um, and what what we do well is the quality aspect and keeping people out of hospital but it's kind of catching up with all the digi stuff that um, we, we need to kind of get on board with Right, OK. Um, I have a question on um, funding. Um, how are virtual wards funded? I know NH NHS England has um, funded um, uh, the programme, but that, that is not um, guaranteed for years to come, as I understand. So uh, could you perhaps um, share some uh, insight into the, the funding models um, for virtual wards? with us. Perhaps that's something, Gemma, would you like to? Um, there's, there's lots of different arrangements. There'll be local arrangements on commissioning of virtual wards. And then there from the NHS England commissioning platform for the um, the large number of beds that they're hoping to commission. Yes. Um, so that the, the variety of ways of commissioning virtual wards, virtual care, from the local arrangements to the national framework. And um, we are uh, primarily speaking about England today, but there will be um, different models available in the other countries of the UK as well for funding and um, implementation. Yes. Um, can I jump in on that one? Um, 
So uh, they mentioned at the in the first presentation about have a really clear idea of what you want from your virtual ward and what what expectations you want from it. And our experience is that if we put a service evaluation design in from the beginning and collect that data as we're going along, it can be used for the business case at the end to to uh, apply for more funding. So that's what we did with one of our services. They started out as a Monday to Friday. They're now seven days and, and had funding for other nurses as well. So it can be um, so that the, the takeaway from that is uh, to try and collect the data as you go along and um, to, to support for further funding. And, and I, I guess related to that, um, where are the where does the staffing come from? Um, forgive me for asking na uh, naive questions as a civilian, but um, we know that there are terrible shortages in the workforce across the board. So, the virtual ward does that take away um, staff from um, a hospital setting? Um, presumably you don't have um, access to additional staff in significant numbers. So could you perhaps uh, give us a little bit of an idea how you staff these services? Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Lucy, but... Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, the, it's the workforce that I'm, I'm really um, passionate about. And I think one of the things that we've found is that we have struggled to recruit to band six posts, um, so frailty practitioners within the team in the last couple of years. But our band seven trainee advanced clinical practitioner posts have been very popular, and we often get about fourteen applicants per um, sort of round for, for one post. Okay. Um, and I think it's because we, we we actually have this training offer, so um, people are, are put on programs with health education. A, a higher a education institutions to do their advanced clinical practice um, the, theoretically at university but with us they get a lot of input across the four pillars because it's obviously not just about the clinical delivery so because we're a consultant practitioner led team we very much encourage and uh, equip our trainee advanced clinical practitioners to focus on research service development leadership and education as well. So it's a very attractive place to work. That's suggesting a career pathway. Absolutely. And we've now got a career pathway that can go up to consultant practitioner to 8C um, and beyond. OK, yeah. um, that actually um, leads in quite nicely to a question that's been asked um, about the development of a core set of competency standards. Um, has that been considered? Um, it's just this... been done, actually. Oh, right. It's out. Okay. Um, right. So um, some colleagues, uh, Esther Clift um, and uh, Emma, Emma Matthews, um, who works with the NHS England, and a whole team of people have created some multi-professional um, capabilities framework for virtual wards. So that's available. Came okay. out um, the end of September. That would be great, I think, to share um, uh, with attendees if you're able to do that. Um, it's obviously would be really useful for them to standardise practice and um, foster development. Um, OK, I'm going to take another uh, questions, um, some more questions from um, uh, attendees. Will a nurse do a follow up check on the patient on the same day? or will they just check on the patient once a day, or the patient will just call the service provider if they need to? Um, I guess there may be some um, variety in responses to that, um, but perhaps uh, Gemma, you, you you might wish to. As, as you say, there, there will be a variety of responses dependent upon the model of the virtual ward, virtual care environment. So from our perspective, with a clinically led call centre with multidisciplinary team clinicians, the technology is providing the information and there's also supplementary welfare calls from a social care coordinator. OK, so if um, so, the monitor the behavioural sensors, the medical observations will flag on the dashboard to say, and these how we prioritise the patient. This will indicate the skill mix, the clinician that needs to speak to the patient. And then 
there's integration and as Rebecca said, there's pathways that are developed when you commence a virtual ward and virtual care service. So you, you understand what pathways there are and referral uh, methods to ensure that the patient gets access to care and support. So for example, we're fortunate in one of the areas where we work in Hampshire is that we provide a home visiting service, we provide integrated urgent care, so we've got access to that. If we're in another area, we could uh, refer patients through integration with NHS pathways. So again, if we don't know all of those pathways, um, we can check the pathways because we can use the directory of services that's available through NHS pathways to make an onward referral for the patient. And then there's interoperability. So again, we have access. If with consent to patients' medical records, we can provide discharge summaries into the GP records and to other services if the clinical IT systems speak to each other. So it's all dependent upon the commissioning and the service delivery model. Right, OK. And, and uh, what's your experience been, Rebecca? Um, yes, I agree very much with what has, has just been said. It completely depends on the service and also the acuity of the patient. So we have some services where we, we as a company, we don't provide face to face visits. Um, but I do know that some of our pathways, they're linked in in a way where, so we've got one coming up. It's a frailty pathway and frailty patients are obviously much, they're, they're, they're harder to care for in a virtual world. They're more complex. There's a lot more involved. So we will be monitoring the readings, but then the, um, the staff actually in that area will be doing the face to face visits. So it really depends very much on the patient group, the acuity of the patients and, and the services that are available in the area as well. OK, thank you. Um, somebody has asked um, what checks and interve interventions are in place um, should a patient suddenly deteriorate? Um, and I guess um, I mean, that would be uh, quite a fear really for, for patients and carers, um, how quickly um, the service would be able to respond. Um, do you have a few uh, uh, and experiences on that, please? So I guess from our perspective, we're not we're not digital at the moment, as I said. Yes. So um, our, the way that we manage it is, for example, um, this morning I had someone who I've been concerned about their blood results for the last couple of days. I had a conversation with the on-call consultant at the local hospital yesterday, actually my one of the trainees who works with us yesterday did and they came up with a bit of a plan that we would recheck bloods again tomorrow and um, but there was all kinds of complexity frailty and um, so the complexity wasn't just around the blood results the observations the infection it was around um, physical function and also um, delirium as well so background of dementia and um, active delirium and so we had all of this going on um, as well as the social complexity and then this morning we discussed it at handover and we just came up with we just said I just sent one of the guys out first thing at handover and just said Look, go out do some obs um, and check some check the bloods again we're not going to wait another day to do this and he got out there and she'd actually expelled her catheter because secondary to her delirium so you know in, there's some circumstances where we can do everything we can to keep people at home and we do we keep really sick people at home people with um, inflammatory markers CRP of over 200 white blood cell count of 17 you know news two scores of six seven we, we can do that but actually some circumstances you just have to put your hands up and um, just before I came onto the panel discussion, the guy said to me, what are we doing here, Lucy? And I was like, I think she's going in. So sometimes you do have to have that recognition that there's as much as we can do at home and um, to keep people at home. And we will do everything we can to respect people's preferences. But sometimes and even sometimes people themselves, you'll know because they'll have said the whole way, oh, I'm not going into hospital ever again. It's not for me. But they say, actually, I feel quite unwell and I'd like to go in. Um, so there's lots of lots of ways of looking at it and managing that. But yeah. Related to that, somebody has asked how fast can you send a community nurse to check a patient um, in, a, in a situation where the patient lives alone and the virtual team has not heard from that patient, which I guess um, perhaps would depend where they are and 
how quickly you can get to them um, in terms of uh, an urban or rural setting, parking, for example, practical elements such as that. Um, is, is there, um, do you have experience of that where you've got well, an I've average? Built, I've built in Sponda, I've managed it in 15 minutes this morning, so. 15 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. That's very reassuring, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Less, less um, good at weekends at the moment. Yes. Weekends we cover a huge patch, an unrealistic patch, and we've learned from that. And from January, we're going to be consolidating our patches to to much smaller geographical areas. But you know, at the weekend we can cover miles of set of over southwest Hampshire. But that's right. changing. Okay. Um, an interesting question here: the equipment that's used. Um, is removed presumably at the end of the patient's stay in the virtual ward. Um, how is that managed and how do patients react to that? Um, Sophie, perhaps you'd like to, to answer that one. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I think it's all about the onboarding process. So as I mentioned with the COVID virtual ward, it takes about 20 minutes to onboard a patient um, to explain to them what's going to happen, what's expected of them um, and what the aim and the outcome is. So as long as your explanation to the patient there is that the equipment is borrowed, it is there to manage you while you're on the virtual ward for whatever length of stay that's going to be and that the equipment will then be returned, either a technician to pick it up or it's collected by a community or district nurse. I think it's all part of the onboarding process and the clinician talking to the patient as well when they first told they're going to be put onto the virtual ward that they will be required and expected to make sure that the equipment um, goes back at the end if if it's owned okay. by the provider. Right okay. Um, is this tablet for example it's dedicated to the virtual ward? You're not going to have patients accessing I don't know, Netflix, um, iPlayer on it as well. Um, daft question, but you do wonder. No, it's not a daft question at all, Lisa. All of our technology is locked down so that the only right. thing the patient can get onto is obviously the application that's needed. Right, OK. And I, I guess then, thank you, that goes for um, other colleagues, so Gemma and, and Rebecca, that would be the same. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I would imagine a similar situation with, um, you know, protecting patient data, etc. All of our phones yes. can be wiped remotely if um, if if they do go awry and we um, we take responsibility for all of that. So we have it kind of built into our model that there will be some devices that we lose and we just take responsibility for that. Um, but it's not as it's not as much as you might think it is. We do we, we, we do get our devices back and it's very hard. You have to be very tech savvy to work your way around that technology so, to try and watch Netflix on them. <laughs> hey, thank you. Um, Moving to um, a completely different question. Are OPAT services incorporated into the virtual world? Can, I'm sorry, can you tell me what an OPAT service is first and then whether they're incorporated into the virtual ward? Lucy was nodding there, so I'll come so to I you. I imagine um, that's older persons assessment teams. So, okay. um, which may come under um, front door services in emergency department, same day assessment, um, older persons assessment liaison, one of those kind of, um, I, I guess that's what that person's um, meaning. And yes, certainly um, we, we would liaise with um, front door frailty services if required, but it's more around the diagnostics from our perspective. So, for example, um, if we if if we need some urgent uh, CT scan, chest X-ray, um, point of care bloods, because at the moment we don't have point of care bloods in our um, in our hubs, but that's what we are looking into. We are going to get that um, very shortly. So it's more around that kind of um, thing. Okay. I I always compare. I always say to people the way I explain our services. We are older persons assessment and liaison, so OPAT, um, in the community. So we are the, we are the equivalent of an emergency team 
um, an older person's assessment team in the emergency department, but we just do everything that they do, that multi-professional approach, but in the person's home with them. Great, thank you. Um, um, sorry, can Rebecca, I just yes. jump in on that one? Sorry, uh, it, the acronyms always mean different things in different places. My experience of OPART is, I don't know what it stands for, but it's community has been community IVs. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, and it can, I don't know which one it, it, it will have been, but um, it can work with community IVs. We do have OPAT pathways. They're not up and running yet, but um, it is something that can be worked in, in conjunction with the, um, with the at-home IV service as well. Okay, thank you. Um, decontamination of equipment. Going back to um, our tablets and wearables, has that been challenging at all? Has anyone had experience of that? Has it been difficult to implement? Um, I can answer on that one. Um, so we actually ended up getting a consultancy firm in to establish a decontamination process with us because we found it's actually different with different clients. So we wanted one that was rigorous enough that suited all clients. Um, but we do also have it where we have one client that doesn't want doesn't want to give us that responsibility. They have their own medical devices department and therefore want to do their own decontamination. Um, but there are are, um, SOPs in place for decontamination and also included in that is calibration of the equipment as well. Right, so it okay. was challenging but we've we've managed to work our way through it. Okay um, and, and Sophie I wonder if that was a factor um, for you with the Covid uh, yeah, thanks. in particular. Thanks Lisa, um, not for us, I mean we manage over 40,000 respiratory patients across the UK so we mm -hmm. do all our own in-home medical engineering, decontamination, um, at the same as, as Rebecca all of our SOPs are already in place, our risk assessments, um, obviously during Covid things were quarantined for 72 hours around government guidelines yes. um, so we'd already got all that in place prior to um, to to COVID coming along because it was just general business for us. Right, OK, thank you. Um, slightly um, downbeat here, are there recorded outcomes that um, virtual wards decrease um, hospital admissions or deaths in the deteriorating patient? Um, I wonder if um, you've had experience or you can point to any um, research or studies um, on this? So obviously the, the research is still um, evolving at the moment, but um, yeah. Sasha Shepard's done, um, um, has, has led quite a lot of research in the area and around comparing comprehensive geriatric assessment as well um, and the outcomes. So I can't remember the contents of all of that paper, but I'm sure that would have mentioned this. Um, and I guess it's it's about the quality over well the quality of death as well. So about adhering to people's preferences, we include treatment escalation planning discussions on the first time we meet a person. We do DNA CPRs with the person, and we um we you know we do advanced care planning as well. So very much in preference to if somebody is deteriorating and it doesn't look like they're um, going to rally and um, really having those realistic conversations about where their place of death would be. Um, so in terms of, you know, whether or not it reduces or increases um, in, patient, in hospital or out of hospital, I'm not sure if that's as relevant as actually, um, you know, adhering to people's preferences and the yes. quality of death that they would have potentially could be better in their own home with the right support. Yes. So th those conversations, um, advanced care planning really should start as early as possible wherever. Yeah. OK. Um, Can I just add in there? I think it's, yes, it's, sure. really, it's really important, as Lucy said, it's about personalised care. So it's developing those care plans that are personalised to those in to those patients and individualise them. And I think what virtual wards does is give us time so that, you know, hospital pace is it's challenging, isn't it? For those working in the hospital environment to have that time with that patient to develop that care plan and build a relationship. Virtual wards and virtual care enables time to develop those relationships to personalise care, to really understand um, what is important to that individual. 
as Lucy said, some do not want to go to hospital, but some may change their mind mm. um, and that they can have a trusting relationship with the team that's looking after them. So we mustn't lose sight of that personalised care. And those with frailty scores, you know, often people with high frailty scores are sadly going to become end of life within the year of discharge from hospital. So it's making sure that we personalise care to give them good end of life care um, and a place of death that they want to be in. So they're fundamental principles, regardless yes. of a virtual ward or yes. in yes. hospital care. OK, thank you. Um, we have um, time probably just for a, a couple of more questions. Um, this is an interesting one. We've spoken about health inequalities. Do you have translator services for patients who do not speak English? Um, and how would you support people who have additional communication needs? So, for example, somebody with a cognitive impairment, a brain injury or dementia. Um, I wonder if anyone has experience um, that they could share with um, with us on translator services, for example. Um, I can quickly jump in on that one. Um, so we have joined with the third party translator service. Very, It's similar to that language line that's used in the NHS. So we can call in um, a, a translator and have a three way call or four way call if the clinician wants to be there as well. Um, and that's to, I think that's over 350 languages that we've got. We're also translating um, our patient leaflets as well. I think um, in terms of additional communication needs, this is something as a company that we are working on because I think we can do better with it. However, at the moment, the way we've managed it is because we've got the customer service agents, um, though it's that human element, they, they're aware of, of, of taking their time, being patient and talking, um, talking patients through using the technology. So to give an example, it would probably take me 10, 15 minutes to be onboarded onto our service, whereas we've taken over two hours to do that for some of our patients. Um, so that's how we manage it at the moment, but it is absolutely um, something that we're looking at improving and hopefully in the future as well, there will be devices that are developed to support those who, who need extra support as well. OK, and Gemma, did you want to um, add any experience there? I think that there are additional applications. There's um, British Sign Language um, an app that um, can support. So there are things in development um, to support, but we do need more. Yeah, it's ever evolving, Yes, it, it seems, yes. Um, data protection, is there backup there for um, to protect the data that you um, obtain from patients, somebody has asked. Um, perhaps I could go to Sophie there. Yeah, sure. So we've got all the relevant accreditations, ISO 27001. Um, ISO 9001, which obviously protects patients' data. Um, there is no patient data saved on any of our tablets. So if one of our tablets was stolen, nobody could get into it anyway. And if they did, it doesn't tell you who it's been with or where it's been. Um, right. Obviously, the virtual ward uh, aspect of it, the clinician portal does hold patient data, which is on a secure server within the UK, um, which is backed up regularly and data is held following NHS guidelines. Um, I think it's around 25 years you hold data for. Um, sorry, I'm not a data protection expert, but we do have a data protection officer within Baywater Healthcare that we follow um, the guidelines for. Right, OK, thank you very much. Um, I think we are on time. Um, we have um, 10 minutes for any further questions. Um, if anybody would like to um, to ask any. Just having a scroll. Um, some of the, the questions just to check there aren't any that I've um, that I've missed. No, I don't think so. OK, um, that's great. Um, thanks very much for being so, um, so open um, and honest and sharing your experiences. Um, 
of virtual wards in your areas and the development of them and um, their implementation. I think um, that's been a really useful session and I, I've cer certainly learned a lot. Thank you for bearing with me and daft questions. Um, it's very illuminating, um, this brave new world. Um, as I said at the beginning, we will be um, holding the second uh, webinar in February next year, um, which will take a look at um, implementation um, in a little more depth of virtual world models and um, delivery. Both webinars will be um, available to attendees um, around, uh, around two weeks or so um, after um, they're held and you'll be emailed um, an attendance certificate and also um, emailed to indicate that the webinar is live. So um, I think that's all. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody, attendees, uh, presenters and sponsors. Thanks very much. Hope to see you all again in February and take care.